Good evening. I'm Sam Roberts, and welcome to Virtually Live from Federal Hall. This is another program in our fall series of Debate Defends Democracy. It's presented by the National Parks of New York Harbor Conservancy in partnership with New York University and the National Park Service. This evening, we focus on a particularly timely topic, democracy and the Electoral College. That mysterious constitutional body that four years ago declared Donald Trump president, even though he lost the popular vote. Why was it created? Does it thwart one person, one vote? Does it prevent mob rule? Has it run its course? The Electoral College was established by Article II, but after the controversial election of 1800, Congress proposed the 12th Amendment, and by 1804, supposedly cleared up that mess. Well, we present Debate Defends Democracy in partnership with the National Park Service and NYU. Tonight's edition, a collaboration with NYU's Brennan Center, a nonpartisan law and public policy institute that combines scholarship with legislative and legal advocacy to protect democracy and advance justice. It's my pleasure to welcome Brennan Center President Michael Waldman, a constitutional lawyer, who will introduce our moderator, the ever gracious John Avlon, and tell us more about the Electoral College. Michael, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sam, and thank you to everybody for being part of this really timely, really timely conversation. We're all talking at a moment when 70 million people have voted in this country, uh, and it's a week before election day. There's intense public interest in this election, intense public commitment to our democracy. And your joining us uh, shows that these issues go deeper than just one election, but in fact, to the question of how can we make our democratic system truly work? It's noteworthy that we are remotely or virtually, I suppose, uh, having this conversation, at least in the vicinity of Federal Hall, because of course it played a pretty significant role in the creation of the Electoral College at the time that the founders debated it and decided what to do at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, it's pretty clear if you look at James Madison's notes that at some level, uh, they didn't pay as much attention to this as they did to some other parts of the Constitution, because the one thing they knew for sure was whatever they did, George Washington was going to be the first president. And he was, in fact, sworn in at Federal Hall. And in his first inaugural address, uh, spoke about uh, the great experiment of America and how each generation had to make that experiment work. Um, well, now we're many decades or centuries later, um, and uh, we are running this presidential election uh, amid circumstances that are quite extraordinary. Uh, the Electoral College is at the front of everybody's mind. So many of us can tell you the many different paths that uh, candidates can take to win. Uh, it's worth noting, and I'm sure our panelists will share this, that this focus on the Electoral College this renewed focus is really a relatively new thing. For over a century, the winner of the popular vote won the presidency. The Electoral College was something of a, of a vestigial organ. But we all know that in the last two decades, that has not been the case. In 2000 and in 2016, the person who lost the popular vote was elected president. It almost happened in 2004, John Kerry, for a few thousand votes that switched in Ohio, he would have won even though he lost the popular vote. And there are distorting effects, arguably, uh, that uh, the Electoral College uh, imposes even in a year where it uh, lines up that the popular vote winner and the Electoral College winner are the same. Uh, those are all the problems with the Electoral College, but as we'll also hear, there are arguments for it. Uh, it has provided decisiveness. It has arguably meant that candidates didn't just focus on a few key constituencies or a few key areas. Um, we'll hear about all of that. 
uh, it's rare to have an issue of constitutional and historical dimension be so urgent and so relevant to so many people as this issue is. And we, we are very fortunate uh, that my friend and uh, a, a leading public voice on issues of American politics and democracy is moderating this. John Avlon is a senior political reporter and analyst at CNN. Uh, he is the author of several great books, uh, including the book on George Washington's Farewell. Uh, and uh, and uh, he will uh, take it from here uh, with his blend of historical insight and political savvy. John, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, I also, I'm going to return the favor by saying that your book, The Fight to Vote, is should be required reading uh, for anyone interested in uh, uh, voting and fairness and history and context and how we can form a more perfect union. This is a, a great conversation we're going to have tonight. As Michael said, it's incredibly timely because this is the time of year, one week out from the election, where uh, people start to wonder, why the hell do we pick the leader of the free world this way? Um, because it is strange. It is characteristically American, um, but it is uh, less uh, sort of handed on from down high in a perfect form by the founders than you might imagine. And there is a robust and perhaps hopeful debate about reform short of a constitutional convention uh, amendment. We are going to have a phenomenal uh, group of folks talking to us about it, beginning with Jesse Wegman. Uh, he's a member of the New York Times editorial board, former colleague of mine at the Daily Beast, and author of the absolutely great book, Let the People Pick the President. Um, uh, which offers history and, and actually specific path to reform uh, through uh, the National Popular Vote Interstate Vote Compact. I got one of those words out of order, but uh, Jesse, um, it's great to have you here, and uh, you're going to uh, people are going to be dazzled by what you know. Also, like to bring in uh, Wilfred Cuttington the third. He's an associate professor at Brooklyn Law, um, the associate at the Brennan Center as well, and he's got a brand new book coming out next year called The People's Constitution. 200 Years, 27 Amendments, and the Promise of a More Perfect Union. I like the way that sounds. Also author of a great article in The Atlantic recently about the racist roots of the Electoral College. And last but no way least, uh, Professor Amel Ahmed from uh, University of Massachusetts, Professor of Political Science. Um, she is a real authority on electoral vote systems. She wrote a book in 2013 called Democracy and the Politics of Electoral System Choice. Um, she is going to be defending the Electoral College uh, to, to some extent, and, um, and I look forward to a lively uh, and constructive conversation with y'all uh, that sheds more light as well as heat, I suppose. Anyway, welcome to Democracy, Debate, uh, debate, debate Defends Democracy at Federal Hall. Um, I want both of you to get a chance to kind of lay out uh, your, your core arguments, um, but I'll, I'll do it by putting some spin at the ball at the top. Uh, Jesse, your position on this is very clear. Your book was timely. Uh, you have been a passionate um, uh, supporter for reform. Um, what, as you look at this election, why should people who aren't clued in care about this and feel the urgency that you do? Well, you know, John, thank you so much for having me. And, 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 and I, it's just going to be a great conversation, I think. And I'll say this, the fact that, that so many people are interested in this issue and so many people are concerned about the electoral college and the way we pick the president, I think really is itself an indication of how troubled it is and how problematic it is. You know, if we had a way of picking the president that I think made sense to most people, we wouldn't have this every four year freak out of potential, you know, misfire where the, the person who gets fewer votes in the country becomes the president. But that's not how it happens. And so people really do get concerned. And I totally understand that. That said, he, I'd like to present a framing that I hope we can sort of return to throughout this conversation because I think it's an important way to think about what we're actually talking about when we say national popular vote versus the Electoral College. Here's what I'll say. We have a national popular vote for president right now. Everybody in America who's eligible and wants to vote votes for the president. They vote wherever they live. They vote in all 50 states in DC. And the only thing that keeps that vote as being registered as such, as a popular vote, is statewide winner-take-all laws 
These are laws that the states adopt themselves. They are not in the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution never discussed them. When they saw them being adopted, they were horrified. They tried to ban them from, the, from, from use in, the, in a constitutional amendment, but they failed. These are laws that states themselves use to award all of their electors to one candidate or the other, whoever gets the most popular votes in their state. But those laws are the only thing that distort this whole system. Otherwise, everybody everywhere is actually voting. So I want us to keep that frame in the back of our minds as we're talking about this. That you know, when we talk about mob rule or you know, federalism or whatever it is we talk about, the mob is voting today. We're all voting and we are all having a say uh, in who our president is. And yet this winner these winner take all laws distort that outcome. So that, that I think is my, my, my opening pitch to rethink the framing of how we talk All about right. this issue. I, I, I love it. And, and, and I think we'll, we'll probably uh, put aside conversation of, of, of the mob because it is, as you indicated, fairly loaded. Uh, but, um, and, and we'll get to Mike Lee's comments about democracy later. But uh, Emil, you know, so you are defending the Electoral College. Um, this was not a particularly controversial position before we had two elections this century. Uh, won by people who lost the uh, uh, popular vote fairly decisively. Uh, this didn't seem to be a real concern in the late 19th century, the other two times it happened. Um, but as I'm looking at election totals and I'm seeing, you know, wow, Texas could be really close. It does seem crazy that you could have, for example, a 52-48 split in Texas. And as long as you're one, you know, one, one vote past the post, you get all those vote, electoral votes. So what, what's the argument for keeping something putting aside the history that can lead to really unrepresentative outcomes. So I would say, um, first I'll say that there's a lot to criticize in the Electoral College, so I don't defend it as the ideal institution in, in some abstract world. Um, but I think I proceed from a place of caution because we know looking around the world that changes to electoral systems always produce unintended consequences. It's really hard to know how these changes are going to impact things. And what they do very often is destabilize politics because democratic institutions in general are put in place to allow actors to develop long term strategies to, to develop any sort of strategies that help them um, become competitive within a system. So there's always uh, the danger of unintended consequences. And it's like a very complex butterfly effect when you change uh, the institution because you don't know how different actors will interact with it. Um, and, and for any sort of put in place, there are unintended consequences that people didn't anticipate. So before we enter into that place, I wanna be sure that the problems that we're identifying are actually being caused by the institution itself and not by other political trends. And so I've really been focused on the empirical puzzle of why these discrepancies have been happening. And for me, it is really a, a question because it's not always happening, the, specifically the discrepancy between the popular vote and the electoral college vote. Uh, this is not something that happens all the time. It's not something that, as you say, we've talked about before. So if this is happening and we know the institution itself hasn't changed, that means we need to look at broader trends in our political system. And what I've been mostly focused on are two really big trends that are happening with party strategy and the, the way in which candidates are strategizing around presidential campaigns. And the two major trends we see is a really uh, significant narrowing to the base where candidates are really focused on their base and, and investing less time and resources trying to persuade swing voters. And that has gone along with a kind of ge geographic sorting where urban centers are becoming a lot more democratic and rural areas are becoming a lot more Republican. These two things are interacting to produce the kind of wasted votes that you're talking about that produce these popular vote electoral college distortion. Now, the really important thing for me is that parties are not victims of these trends. They're producing the trends. They're creating the trends that are leading to these distortions. What's also really important to me is that it is a sign of party weakness when you have parties that are so narrowly focused and, and unable to broaden their coalitions, even when it's strategically advantageous for them. So that is something that concerns me. And if we're talking about changing our electoral institutions to accommodate that kind of weakness, I think it's a self-defeating strategy. Can I just push back on, on you on one, one point? Um, I mean, in this election, we're certainly seeing Joe Biden uh, try to reach out uh, to, to swing voters and build a broader coalition. We're notably not seeing that among, uh, 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 about Donald Trump. So is, it a, is this an asymmetric problem of polarization as you see it? Uh, or 
is it more of a Republican problem in terms of playing the base and gaming the system, uh, given at least how Biden has campaigned, not to say that Bernie Sanders hypothetically would, would have chosen the same strategy? So I think both parties are pursuing the strategy. We see the effects much more with the Democratic Party because in urban strategy, and it tends to be much more difficult to calibrate. Um, it's very hard when you pursue this kind of urban strategy um, to, to adjust it so that you get the, the desired outcomes, which is why we saw in 2016, Clinton had you know, a million extra votes in, in California. Um, but I do think both strategies are, are pursuing the, these kind of very, uh, both parties are pursuing these very base strategies. Um, the outcome is different for, for each. Okay, uh, Wilfred, uh, you know, certainly you can't understand American political history without understanding the role of race. Um, but I, I, I wanna talk about uh, how uh, race impacts the current predicament we're in and, and how you think a path to reform might lead to more equitable and, and representative outcomes. Sure. Um, well, thank you for this uh, conversation. Thanks to my panel, co-panelists. Um, you know, stated frankly, I think we have uh, over the trajectory, over the course of American history, have um, gotten closer towards that more perfect union, which is to include people of all walks of life, including people who were never considered even people under uh, some people's uh, mindsets. Um, and it's, it's, we got to this point where um, we, we really embrace this principle of one person, one vote, mm -hmm. and uh, the Electoral College really frustrates this ideal. Um, and when it does, because of the winner-take-all system uh, that Jesse raised earlier, what happens is uh, minorities are often the ones who pay the price. So I, I, I use the example of Georgia, um, which is where a bunch of my family lives. Most of my siblings actually live in Georgia. And their vote and the votes of Black people in Georgia, which account for a sizable minority in Georgia, has frequently counted for nothing in the, the race for the presidency because they are... Um, I guess, in a lake of more conservative voters. So despite the fact that you have um, some 25 uh, or more percent of Black voters in Georgia, they find it uh, not even useful to go to the polls because at least in the vote for the presidency, their vote is not going to count. So their, their vote is not given the due weight that um, a vote somewhere else would be given. And sure. you also could look at uh, a distortion that the Electoral College gives for small states. And if you look at the small states, these small states that get a benefit for having the baked in two um, extra bonus electoral votes for having two senators, uh, those states are way more white than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. um, you can just look at them and they are not representative of the country. So I, I, I guess, when we're talking about the distortions and the disincentives, this is going to disincentivize people to kind of pursue a multicultural strategy. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, here, here's where history does play very clearly because, you know, it, it, beyond the, 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 the roots of one of the original corrupt bargains in the U.S. Constitution, the Three-Fifths Clause, um, it, it really does, in states that have tended to swing first Democrat for 100 years in the wake of the Civil War, then after the Civil Rights Act, Republican, um, you know, it, it creates an effective disenfranchisement in terms of the vote uh, for president, uh, for, you know, states that might have, a, a, you know, 30%, 40% African-American population, um, which is disproportionately in the South, which goes disproportionately uh, for more conservative candidates. But let, let, Jesse, let me, let me bring you back here because there, there are two things I, I learned a lot from your book and I really enjoyed it. But one of the really stunning things I, I found out is that, well, we always focus on, okay, you know, this has happened twice this century, happened twice at the end of the 19th. But you make, a, you have an amazing statistic about how, how close we've come to a division between the popular vote and the electoral outcome throughout our history. There have been a number of elections that came down 60, 70,000 votes. T tell folks about that and then as a chaser, do you have any doubt that if Republicans lost Texas this time around, that all of a sudden you'd see more Republicans supporting uh, <laughs> electoral college reform? I'll answer the chaser first, which is no, I have no doubt. Um, uh, we have seen throughout American history that parties and, and citizens 
uh, defend the Electoral College only insofar as they see it uh, working to their political benefit. And the moment that it doesn't, they, they, the scales fall from their eyes and they realize what is this insane system that we use to elect the president. I take it, by the way, I take Amel's point uh, very seriously. She's uh, far more uh, uh, educated and thoughtful about uh, electoral systems and how they function and dysfunction than I am. And I think her point about unintended consequences and, and how parties over time adapt to a system that's been in place for a long time is very well taken. And I don't mean to downplay it. However, I will say this, you know, you're right, John, that throughout American history, and certainly in the last 100 years, there have been multiple examples where a few, sometimes as few as 10,000 votes uh, could have swung the 10,000 votes uh, scattered among a few states could have swung the election. And it really just brings us back to that winner take all problem, right? This wouldn't happen if we didn't have state winner take all rules. Remember in 2000, on election night 2000, we think of 2000 as this crazy kind of 36 day brouhaha where you know all over Florida people are fighting and going to court and coming back from court and there's media campaigns and there's banging on the windows of polling precincts as they try to recount the ballots. But actually, that's all because of the Electoral College and the winner take all law, which left Florida's 25 electoral votes. Then they had 25 electoral votes up for grabs. And it ended up being a matter of a few hundred votes out of 6 million cast in the state that decided all of Florida and thus all of the election. On election night, we knew on November 7th, 2000, we knew who had won the popular vote, right? It was Al Gore. There was never any question. And in, a, in an election of that size, of the magnitude of the entire United States, the odds that you're going to have such a close finish in the popular vote are exceedingly small. Mm -hmm. So I really think that's another argument. You know, people often worry, oh, what about recounts? What about what happens if there's a few thousand votes here, a few thousand votes there? But really, where we see the problem happen is in individual states. And I think if you had a national popular vote, states can still count their own votes. But when you have a national popular vote, the odds of that happening are much, are much lower. Okay. Um, so I want to, I want to give you a chance to answer that. And I want to also folks who are watching, we've got a, we've got a great crowd. Um, please put your questions to us in the Q and A and we're going to intersperse them throughout. Um, look, uh, Amal, the, the obvious argument against it is look, um, you get candidates paying really close attention. It's kind of like the primary system schedule. You get them paying really close attention to voters in places they might not otherwise go. Um, and while, uh, you know, it, it means that if you live in the most populous states in the country other than Florida, that your vote effectively doesn't count. That's very valuable from an educational and representative democracy perspective. But how do you square that against the more basic principle that was articulated fairly late in, in American history of one person, one vote? Simple, clear, common sense. So I think on the question of one person, one vote, the, you know, that question gets to, uh, goes back to a time when people actually had multiple votes, where you had this estate system, especially in European democracies, uh, people literally got additional votes if they owned property, if they met certain qualifications. Um, but what you're talking about is disproportionality. So the outcome that we get as a result of the Electoral College is disproportionate, but there are lots of places in democratic theory and in, this, in the study of democracy where you can support disproportionate outcome. We don't simply govern by majority rule. Uh, so I think there, you can emphasize the, the um, individual preferences as the ultimate democratic goal. We can also emphasize uh, group interests as the ultimate democratic Product goal. The Electoral College is something that gets us closer to a place where we are also acknowledging group interests. And, and I think that is also a valuable democratic objective. Now, I think, you know, the, the point about the winner take all, that's really, that is at, that is at, um, at the heart of it, what the Electoral College is. It is a national popular vote that is aggregated at the state level and awards electors according to the, the winner take all system within states. The problem is if you remove that, you go back to just a, a, a direct election of the executive by, national, by, by a popular vote. And we had a question come up in the chat, does any other country use the Electoral College or something like it? Um, no, to my knowledge, no other country uses the Electoral College. I think Argentina had it for, for a while, but no other country currently uses anything like the Electoral College. But no other established democracy elects their executive through direct popular vote. That also is not practiced because that produces a kind of fragmentation that's not um, 
that's not generally healthy in, in the executive where you only have one seat to give. You want to allow parties different mechanisms and different institutions of aggregating interests and, and identifying competing choices. Well, so does that mean that, I mean, presumably that uh, parliamentary system is predominant? And do you think that based on your study is, is actually a better system, quote unquote? So I think we are far from a parliamentary system. So I, I think um, it is a system that um, allows for greater connection between the executive and, and the legislative branch. So that helps to smooth things over, but it doesn't afford the same kinds of checks and balances that our system has. Um, so I think it is possible to have a separate executive. So France, for example, has a separately ex elected executive, but they do it through a runoff system. So it's still not direct election of, uh, it's not an instant runoff, it's an actual runoff. But what a mechanism like that does is it gives gives parties an opportunity to build coalitions even in between the different rounds to make sure that the, the winner has a critical mass of support. So I just, I, I, the point I was making is that there isn't any country that just has direct election of the executive because it's only one seat and in national politics when you only have one seat to give and the entire country is relying on that one seat, you want to implement as many mechanisms as possible to make that a consensus choice. The Electoral College is a mechanism that tries to do that imperfectly, certainly. Um, but I think having that intermediary step is really important for the office, for, for the executive office. The Electoral College being an intermediate step? The Electoral College, there are alternatives. There are, the runoff system is another one of those intermediary steps that allows political actors to kind of intervene and build coalitions, build consensus around certain candidates. Right. So you don't end up with five different candidates splitting the vote, for example. Right. Well, we, we rarely had that problem. But, Wilfred, we got a question from Jeanette Martinez asking you to sort of build out a little bit uh, your, your comments that, uh, you know, black voters don't count in, in Georgia. And then I'd be interested to know what, what your preferred remedy for this is, working within the realm of the possible, uh, not the perfect. The possible, I think, is, uh, <laughs> or the perfect would be more towards a direct popular vote with a runoff system. So that would actually take into account uh, Professor Ahmed's um, consideration about having or trying to disincentivize or uh, disallow fracture, fracturing amongst the different parties and allowing for some semblance of governance. And in fact, most of the proposals that include uh, a direct popular vote include a system for a runoff above, for example, a threshold of 40%. Um, right now, uh, th that would be very difficult. Um, that is a heavy lift because to do that, you would uh, need to amend the constitution, which requires super majorities in both Congress and the state legislators. Um, so right now there's actually uh, a system that others reformers are pushing for um, the direct popular vote to call the national a popular vote compact. And what that is, it, it uses the current framework, which is that it, it builds off the fact that you use these electors in the electoral college, but it also builds on the sort of part that allows states to determine who they allocate their electors to. So a group of states who are, um, once they get to uh, an, enough states that account for 270 uh, electoral votes, which is enough to determine the outcome of the presidency, they're saying once we get to that point, we'll, we'll all award our electors to the winner of the national popular vote, irrespective of whether that person won the popular vote in our state. So they are basically trying to use the current system to uh, make the current sort of system as we know it unnecessary. Um, if that makes sense. Sure. No, no. And, and Jesse, that, that really is a perfect segue to you because this is really the prime driver of your book. You, one of the unexpected heroes of your book is Birch Bayh, who actually came shockingly close uh, to getting a constitutional amendment through. Um, but then you point out that there is this other alternative that's been devised since uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, tell us now what the current status is in terms of how many states have supported it. Uh, and what the Supreme Court, uh, I mean, you know, the questions of the constitutionality, I mean, the court just decided a faithful selector decision. Uh, is that still like a, a green light for, for, for national popular vote interstate compact? Um, and, and what, according to your calculation, when could it get, when could it do sure. Um, I'll answer that question. I'll first just say this is a, a minor modification of something you said earlier, which was that before 2000 and 2016, when we've seen these two split elections in such a short order, people weren't really that concerned about the Electoral College. 
I will agree with you uh, uh, on the level of, of the general population that, that it never really rose to the level of, uh, with one exception uh, that you just mentioned in the late 1960s, rose to the level of, of national concern. But there have been around 800 efforts in Congress to amend or abolish the college throughout American history, starting in 1797, which is 10 years, only 10 years after the Constitutional Convention. So people throughout American history, at least people who understand how the system works or fails to work, have been concerned about it from the beginning and have been trying to change it. Let me, let me just emphasize that point for a second, yeah. because the, a lot of the argument that people use when it's working in their favor is this is what the founders intended. Yeah. They were geniuses no. and we shouldn't mess with it. It's worked for this long. But one of the points your books make is, no, this was a Frankenstein compromise that they thought was a terrible idea from jump. Exactly. They, they did not anticipate the rise of national political parties, which happened within a few years after the Constitutional Convention. The Constitution, as it was drawn up, did not accommodate uh, competing political parties. And so almost immediately, the, uh, the electoral college system that they designed stopped functioning the way they thought it would function, and it never has functioned that way. To answer your question um, about the National Popular Vote Compact that Wilfred just explained uh, very nicely and clearly, I think is, uh, that there are now 15 states that have joined it. It was, it was introduced in 2005 uh, in, to the public and states started adopting it in 2007. So we're about 13, 14 years in now to its public uh, uh, you know, consideration. 15 states plus DC have adopted it. Remember, Wilfred said you need to have 270, 270 electoral votes worth of states joining this compact, this agreement, before it takes effect. Right now, it is, it is hibernating. It is waiting to take effect. So those 15 states plus DC represent 196 electoral votes, and you need 270 to become president. Do the math, you get 74 votes away. They are 74 votes short uh, at this point from reaching it. The problem with the uh, states that have joined to date is that they are all Democratic-led states, or as uh, people would say on TV, blue states. Um, I hate that term because it, it implies that there are no conservatives or Republicans who live in blue states, and there are no liberals who live in red states, which is absurd, and that's what drives me crazy about the, the winner-take-all rule. But uh, there are no yet, yet, as yet, no state with Republican leadership has passed this compact. And I think that's problematic for multiple reasons. Uh, in fact, there has been a lot of Republican interest around the country in this, in this uh, uh, compact. And several Republican uh, legislatures have taken it quite seriously and have even passed it through one, uh, one a chamber of their uh, state legislature. But to date, there have been none that have actually enacted it into law. And I think that really needs to happen if this is going to be a successful push. We've got a question from John Walter, and, and I'll, I'll, whoever wants to answer this, and my instinct is Jesse may have the most info, but maybe not. And if, if not, I'd love the other, uh, Ahmed and Wilford to do this. Wouldn't Article 5 make the compact unconstitutional? From John Walter. Um, I, I, I th uh, well, I'm not exactly sure what uh, which part of Article Five uh, the questioner is asking about. I think perhaps l let me recast it, and he can tell me if I've got it wrong. Um, he may be referring to the Compact Clause of the Constitution, uh, which is in Article One, and which states that uh, any uh, state any interstate compact needs congressional consent before it can take effect. Um, that is what the Constitution says. However, for more than 100 years, the Supreme Court has very clearly distinguished among different types of interstate compacts and does not require congressional consent uh, for certain types of compacts. The people who run the National Popular Vote Compact make what I consider to be a very strong argument that theirs is of the type that does not require congressional consent. Nevertheless, they are also, uh, for a sort of belt and suspenders approach, as I report in the book, they are also uh, uh, attempting to get congressional consent um, be, just you know, to make sure that that, that that isn't a constitutional challenge if, if and when the, uh, the compact reaches 270 electoral votes. Uh, Amal, do you have any questions about the constitutionality of a National Popular Vote Compact? And do you think that's an elegant way to deal with the situation or, or you're still skeptical on fundamental process grounds? We don't well, know the- I'm sorry, my concern has more to do with um, the constitutionality of it. I don't uh, know that much about. What I am concerned about is how destabilizing it might be overall. And I think you can identify the most perfect, ideal democratic institution, but if you impose it without a consensus and without agreement, it's going to be destabilizing. So my concern about it is that it seems to be a fairly elaborate workaround to get a change in place without a constitutional amendment. Um, so I would support any of the 
these reforms if they were if they went through the, the constitutional mechanisms. But I think um, the, the National Popular Vote Compact is, is potentially destabilizing in its own right. Can I to ask a semi-obvious follow-up? Um, if President Trump, because I, I think we're, we're ignoring something that's significant about this race, um, which is it, it's the first time probably in our history uh, that an pre incumbent president has not tried to win the popular vote. And if Donald Trump were to win re-election narrowly while losing the popular vote by, say, double the margin he did last time, do you think that would be destabilizing? Yes, I, I, I think it absolutely would be. And I think we are entering, and this is part of my, my real concern about what, how these parties are handling things, is we're entering a place where uh, Republican candidates are essentially given up on the popular vote. And Democrats are, you know, really playing a risky strategy with, with the Electoral College. Now, I am not, uh, I generally don't think it's useful to appeal to parties to go against their self-interest. So it's in the self-interest of Republicans to stay the course because it can deliver electoral college victories. My appeal tends to focus more on Democrats and um, helping them to identify better strategies. And you, you mentioned earlier that Biden seems to be expanding his, his strategy, expanding his coalition. Perhaps, we haven't really seen uh, very hard numbers on that yet, but what I'm more inspired by, for example, are uh, campaigns like Harrison in, in South Carolina, who said, you know, this idea that Republican, that, that Democrats can't win South Carolina is rubbish, and I'm going to show you how, and we're going to build different coalitions, and we're going to, uh, you know, develop a different narrative. Now, whether or not he can actually, uh, you know, make it across the finish line with that message, we'll see. But I, I'm really inspired by uh, the approach and the narrative that it's weaving that we can reach into these different communities and we can identify common interests. Wilford, what do you think of that? Um, so I, I guess I have a couple points. Um, one, I, I just want to build on what Jesse said about, he, he mentioned the combat clause and to the extent that you want to talk about Article 5, um, Article 5 is the amending provision of the Constitution and the idea that this doesn't work within the constitutional system um, just doesn't really make sense because the National Popular Vote um, Compact, the legislation itself says that if the Electoral College were to be amended or abolished or what have you, the deal would fall apart because you'd have no electoral, electoral votes that serve as the basis of the actual compact. So it, it, it can't be unconstitutional in terms of uh, Article 5. And I just want to echo what Jesse said, that the combat clause has not been uh, thought to be an outright ban on the creation of compacts without congressional consent. Um, I think we also just need to put a lot of this in context. Um, we, we need to think about the other systems we're interacting with. And now it makes sense sometimes to have counter-majoritarian um, elements in a constitutional system to make sure that certain values and certain rights are preserved irrespective of what happens in elections. So example, we, we uh, really cherish free speech. We really cherish due process. We really cherish equality. Those sorts of things are worth uh, putting at a higher threshold to change because we prize them so much. But to institute a system where um, you have one half of your legislator that is now um, controlled by minority, where you have your entire executive branch that is determined by minority, and those two uh, components together choosing a minority in a Supreme Court to actually, that is unaccountable to the people. I think at that point, we're not even talking about checks against uh, majority tyranny. We're looking at uh, an, an entrenchment of minority rule. And I, and I think that becomes a problem. So expecting people to change their campaign tactics to fit within a system that they can't sort of work through because it calls for appealing to a minority, it, it just really, I guess it just, under, it, it just undermines the values that we um, tend to think are the highest political values for a society. I, 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 could I step in? Could I, would you mind if I just uh, add on to that for a moment? Sure. Um, you had mentioned Mike Lee earlier, uh, Senator Lee of Utah. Yeah, I'm getting to Mike Lee. Yes. Made this comment that's become, I'd say, disturbingly, uh, uh, the people uh, on the right have become disturbingly comfortable saying versions of we're not a democracy. Um, it used to be we're a republic, not a democracy. And now Mike Lee is just saying we're not a democracy. 
Um, I would say that the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the people who have uh, fought and died for um, you know, equal yeah. rights and representation would take exception there. America is absolutely a democracy. It's a representative democracy, as everyone who studies uh, even a little bit of American civics knows. It is also a republic, a repu both of which, both representative democracy and republics are characterized by the people themselves governing themselves through their, through their elected representatives, the people choosing representatives to uh, act on their behalf. And I really think, uh, as Wilfred said, that is the key problem here is that you're, you have minority rule, literally minority rule. You have a president who's chosen by fewer people. You have a Senate, which is chosen by millions of fewer people and represents millions fewer people, a uh, majority of the Senate than the minority. You have a Supreme Court now in which five of the six justices, five of the nine justices were selected by presidents who did not win a popular vote and confirmed by senates that, that did not represent a majority of Americans. When you have all of that stacked up, you don't have a democracy and you don't have a republic. You know, the founders themselves said it again and again. They said the essence of Republican government is the will of the majority. That they were very clear on that, you know. And so while we do have, as Wilfred said, counter majoritarian checks on our system, we are so far from that being the problem right now. The problem right now is minority rule. And, and the entrenchment of minority rule. And I really think electing the president by a popular vote is only one small component of that bigger system. You're still gonna have the Senate. You're still gonna have state legislatures and governors. You're still gonna have the House of Representatives. So you still have all of those checks and different systems of government that are running roughly the same way they do today. You just elect the president by a popular vote. So uh, let, me, let me get back to ML and then Wilford on this, let, let's say, uh, because Mike Lee's tweets, I think, were an attempt to create an intellectual framework for front of some of Donald Trump's impulses, right? He said, look, democracy is not the point. Peace and prosperity are the point. Um, and, um, and, and that did raise people's antennae. Um, but if you have a situation where um, you've got a, a contested vote in a couple of key states and legislators, uh, Republican legislatures try to uh, override the popular vote, and it goes to the House of, of Representatives, let's say, um, uh, and possibly the Supreme Court with Kavanaugh's comments yesterday. Uh, what do you think the, the correct response is to that in terms of both defending the integrity of a democratic republic, but at the same time, uh, trying to uh, value uh, stability um, and, and, and give us an option for reform and reconciliation? Uh, Emma, I'll start with you. I think the key to understanding both Mike Lee's comments and, and, and the response to it is that we are now in a contest of democratic values. I think it's very easy to say, I know what's democratic and, and you're opposing me, so you're, you're the autocrat. And I think we've heard a lot of that rhetoric. I think there are signs of autocratic tendencies in this country and that's undeniable. But I think also what people mistake often is that you have a real contest of democratic values. And so what we're seeing here, principles of majority rule versus minority interest, group interest versus individual preferences, these are different democratic principles. And I think we need to talk more transparently and more explicitly about them. And we need to be willing to fight for the version of democracy that we're interested in and not let Mike Lee go off and say, well, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Any way you cut it, we're talking about uh, different principles that will include certain groups and exclude others. So I think I'm much more interested in having this be a political contest over what we value and what we're interested in, rather than a technical debate about what is or is not democratic, because so many things are democratic. The, the essence of democracy is, is lots of different principles. So let's have that fight and, and let's, you know, roll up our sleeves and and have it through our uh, parties and through our representatives. Now, I know, you know, I'll just say one thing because I, I realize that offering changing parties or changing campaign strategies as an alternative to changing institutions may not seem that enticing. It certainly is uh, not as glamorous an approach, but I think it's both doable and, and important and, and effective to pay attention to what these parties are doing and what our representatives are saying and doing. Uh, because at the end of the day, parties are really the things that allow democracy to function and endure over the long term. Wilfred? Um, so you, you spoke about uh, sort of this potential for state legislators to take away the, or, or rescind their uh, state's popular vote. That, I think that highlights just another problem with the Electoral College, right? The idea that 
that your state can vote or the people can vote and then you have a handful of people who are gonna say, we're just gonna cancel that. We're gonna cancel that entirely. Um, once you get to a point where we're, we're talking about contested elections here, that, that possibly brings you to a, a point in the electoral college structure that's actually even less democratic, which is the contingent election process. And if there is no clear winner in the electoral college, what happens is that throws it to the house of representatives with each state getting one vote, irrespective of the size of the state. So California and Wyoming will have the same vote. Um, it's really hard to have a real frank discussion about democratic values and what a democracy means and what things we cherish when the majority of people are fighting from below the, 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 the rest of the people. I mean, it, it, we're talking about the need for a debate about this, but there, there is no, there's no level ground for this. It, right. it is just, it's, it's, it's tremendously difficult. And I, I think that that's not a, a, a fair presumption. Uh, you can talk about what fairness means, but um, it's, it's really hard to have that discussion when you are actually the majority and you're being ignored or thwarted. Sure. sure. So, so if we find ourselves in that situation from a perspective of, of a law professor, um, what do you think the appropriate response is? Uh, which, which one of these situations? I'm sorry. If, 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 if all of a sudden, you know, we, we are seeing the Electoral College itself even thwarted um, for what you described as minority rule with legislatures interceding and it going to uh, the House. Can I offer uh, one comment, John? Uh, I'd rather have Wilfred finish first. Sure. Um, I think that we're really, once we're in that hole, we're in, we're in a really deep hole. And um, I hesitate to say that, like, if this ends up going to the House of Representatives and the House of Representatives represents a minority, when you look at it from the one state principle, that we're going to rely on them. I hesitate to say we're going to rely on a Supreme Court that, as Jesse said, was appointed, um, half, more than half of the members were appointed by a minority president. I hesitate to, like, look at these uh, counter-majoritarian functions that have turned to minority rule functions to, for salvation. I, I, really, I, I really don't know what to do from a constitutional standpoint. It does demand change. It demands that we actually win elections under a system under, um, where, where the people are sort of less valued and, and then make changes. I, I don't think the answer is to uh, sort of change your campaign style or change your appeal because that then, then you're actually pushing off other people that have a right to also be heard in this system. I, I, I don't think that that's, that's the solution. Okay. Emma? Uh, the, the only point I was gonna make is that what you're describing is a democratic crisis. It is a fundamental democratic crisis and there is a very strong possibility that we are looking at that in this upcoming election. So I think we all need to be very sober about that. And I totally agree with Wilfred. I don't think the courts are gonna save us. I don't think any sort of institutional mechanism is going to save us. And in that scenario, we need to count on our leadership and we need to count on leaders who are willing to accept defeat. And without that, or, and we need to really, uh, we also need to be willing on all sides to accept defeat if the outcome uh, corresponds to mechanisms that are established, whether or not they, they uphold our personal democratic beliefs. We need to be able to support the process that is in place, and that is really our commitment to democracy. That's the only resolution that I see to a potential democratic crisis. Okay. Can I, can I uh, just add, add on yeah. to that? Um, I think Amel is right about that, and, and I, I, I I do think, and I've said this before, that one of the most important nights in American history was December 13th, 2000. Um, and, I, and I put it right up there with July 4th, 1776 as, as a moment that uh, helped uh, define and protect the Republic. Uh, and that was when Al Gore stood before the American people after the final uh, Supreme Court's ruling in Bush v. Gore, the 5-4 ruling against him, ending the, the voting count in Florida and giving the election, uh, the state and the, and, the, and the White House to George W. Bush, Al Gore standing up and saying, I disagree with this, but I accept it because the Supreme Court is the final voice in this matter. Now, I think there was even debate at that time whether the Supreme Court was the final voice or should be, and many of Al Gore's uh, uh, defenders and, and aides 
uh, urged him to fight on and to push this thing, you know, into, into January. Um, but Al Gore chose not to do that, I think, for some of the reasons that Amel is articulating now, which is, you know, the stability and the con continuity of American government. Um, I, we can debate that all, all, all night, but I do think that that recognition that, that we do have a set of rules that have been established and as long as they exist, we, we have to abide by them is really crucial to the survival of democracy. Um, we got a question from David Jastrub who, who makes the point that wouldn't parties be more in, incentivized to uh, persuade voters outside of their quote unquote base, whether it be political, regional, um, uh, if there was a popular vote? I yes. think so. Uh, Sorry. You can look at the statistics, the, the turnout in the swing states, the battleground states, the purple states, as we're all hating them uh, being called at this point. Uh, they are higher in uh, presidential election years than they are in states that feel like they're on the sidelines. Um, you know, Professor Ahmed talked about incentives or, or, or sort of um, what might happen once you change a system. I think that's one of those uh, positive externalities that we could probably look forward to if we had the rest of the country, that 70% of the country who feels left on the sidelines, actually participating in the selection of the one person who's supposed to rep represent the entire country. I think that would be one of those ones and I'd be, worth, uh, I'd be okay with taking that gamble. Can I, can I add to that? So uh, Wilfred's absolutely right that the turnout in swing states is significantly higher uh, than it is in non-swing states. And there's only a few swing states in the country in any given year. And that's for the obvious reason that when people think their vote matters, they turn out to vote more. Um, yep. You know, I've, I've never lived in a state where my vote mattered. And, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of sweet. Bad that choices, I like, that I, <laughs> Sorry? Bad choices. <laughs> that it's 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 kind of like quaint that I still think that you know I should go and cast my ballot on election day for the president because nobody's ever cared what my vote is. That's a horrible <laughs> feeling for tens of millions of Americans to have in a representative democracy. And actually, the final chapter of my book, chapter nine, I try to test this hypothesis, and I I actually reached out to campaign managers and field directors of both Republican and Democratic presidential campaigns of the last quarter century, and I said. How would you have run your campaigns differently if you had had to win the popular vote instead of the Electoral College? And to get to the, to, to the question that the questioner asked, which I think is a really insightful one, they all said we would do it totally differently and we would, prefer, well, with, with, with a couple of uh, exceptions, which you have to read the book to find out who they are, uh, they all said we would prefer a popular vote election. And that's because they know they know the distortions that are introduced by this battleground safe state dichotomy, right? They know that it's not right for the president who's supposed to represent all Americans everywhere to focus on a few slivers of Pennsylvania and Florida and Ohio and Michigan. You know, it's like, yes, those are Americans too, but they're not more Americans than the rest of us. We should all be counting equally because we're electing a person who is representing all of us equally. There are many other branches of government and many other levels of political office, both federal and state, that represent people on their state level, that represent people on their city and their town level. And I think this is the one office that we have where everybody is supposed to be represented equally. The framers themselves, some of the top framers wanted this. So I don't think this is some sort of modern liberal gripe. This is something that has been advocated from the beginning of the Republic. And I really think it, you know, there's no, there, I, I see, you know, I think Amel has made the, some of the most uh, thoughtful and cogent arguments in defense of the system that we have. And I still just don't think that there's any good argument to keep the system the way that it is now. All right. I want to get uh, Wilfred and Amel a chance to uh, close things up before we bring back Michael and, and Sam. Wilfred, I wonder if you would speak, because you addressed this in your article. Um, it's always a jump ball, even how much people who are in the political system serving uh, are, are, are aware sometimes how their actions echo history. Um, but there's a, a long history in this country of uh, trying to rig a system to retain uh, power and privilege on the part of white people at the expense of African Americans. Going back to Reconstruction and the court cases after them being one of the most egregious, but not the most egregious, that going back to the time of the Constitution. I wonder if you would just walk people through uh, how some of these attempts to uh, block the will of the majority uh, are, are historically resonant in really ugly ways. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll start with the Electoral College itself. And, and, and I don't want to um, 
sort of put it out there that the like slavery or race was the only reason why the Electoral College was created, but it was very much in the foreground as the framers were considering how to create a system uh, of, for choosing not just the president, but also the House of Representatives and, and the legislative in general. Um, so, um, you know, these were black people, black bodies being horse traded at, at a convention where half of these men were slave owners. And, and, and sort of just to put it in context, when the idea of electors, um, whether they to be served as intermediaries with knowledge or to help um, foster a separation of powers, when that first came up, that was rejected, resounded. And then when the idea of the Connecticut Compromise came up, that is for the bicameral system, a Senate and a Congress, came up the first time, that was also rejected. It wasn't until the framers agreed on the three-fifths compromise, which was the compromise that said 60% of slaves, most of which were in the southern states, would count towards your representative power in the legislature, did they accept that Connecticut compromise, which was the foundation for the electoral college system that we had until slavery was abolished. Um, when they tried to reform this, when they were, um, when reconstruction actually occurred, and, uh, you know, we, we had this roundabout way to getting black people the right to vote because we were thinking about ways you might tinker with the system without actually giving it directly. You know, we got the 14th, Amen 14th Amendment that was supposed to penalize um, states for, um, um, for disenfranchising black people instead of just saying actively, you know, black people have an actual constitutional right to vote. Um, is race was a problem again in the a Compromise of 1877 when um, there were um, disputed electoral votes in the South uh, and, and sort of dueling certificates of election. And that sort of was one of the big uh, enders of what we call um, the Reconstruction period. Race came up again when the Electoral College was discussed and debated in the 1969 and 1970, and it was Strom Thurmond, a, a, a staunch uh, segregationist, who was sort of shotgunning the whole uh, affair of keeping the Electoral College because he knew that it treated people uh, unequally based on where they live, and specifically Black people in the South. So whether we're talking about from the start to the finish and at intervals in between, race has always been a, a, a factor in uh, building, retaining, or keep supporting the Electoral College. And I, I think in this era, and, and, and particularly in the wake where people are reevaluating our country's relationship with race, we really do need to reevaluate this too, because this is a, a vestige of, of all the problems that we've had in terms of race and democracy. Amen. Thanks. Mel, let me just give you a chance to close this out before we bring in Michael. Um, and Sam, um, you've obviously made good faith arguments with a broad global perspective on the preferred system, knowing, as, as you acknowledge, that you know we could be a couple of thousand votes in a handful of states um, away from a, a, a democrat, lowercase d, democratic crisis, crisis in our democracy. Um, do you really think that the status quo is less risky? Um, than reform? And if so, other than the constitutional amendment, which I think you'd acknowledge is probably impossible, given the polarization you, you correctly identify as a core driving problem, what would be your path to uh, reforming the system to make it more fair? So thank you for the question. Um, and I want to answer that by tying it into some of the history that, that we've had discussed today, because I think it's tempting to think that, you know, Jesse points out the, uh, it's, it's important to demystify the, the, the origins of this institution, that there was no real genius behind this, that they just kind of muddled their way through. Wilfred points out the really unethical uh, motivations behind the institution. And those, those are all hugely important. But I think it's also important to remember that undoing the institution doesn't undo the harm and the damage that they've done. So a lot of my work has focused on the last major electoral reform in the United States, which was the electoral reform that introduced the single member district system that we have, that we use for elections today, introduced in the 1840s to undermine uh, nascent workers' parties, nascent labor parties, and it succeeded. And you know, decades and centuries later, we could undo this institution, but that's not going to undo the harm. So, what, 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 what facilitates a real remedy is looking soberly, you know, understanding the history so we don't think that we are trapped in certain outcomes, 
but also being creative with the remedies for our current context. And I think from my part, if a remedy does not come with a, a political solution, it can't just be a technical solution. It has to be a political solution that deals soberly with the fundamentals of our democracy. And part of that has to be political parties and how they're interacting with the institutions. Because if we keep just you know, modifying institutions to accommodate a, a sort of political weakness, mm -hmm. there's really no end to that. To that mm -hmm. That's a, that's a very fair and important point. What I'm hearing a common fluid line is once Republicans lose Texas, uh, then maybe the parties will be incentivized to, to come together, possibly. I want to bring in, thank you all very much. This was a great conversation. All the perspectives. I want to bring back in Sam and Michael to take us home. Thank you very much. Michael, are you there? I guess I, I will have the privilege of going first. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, to John Avalon, to my colleague Wilfred Codrington, a fellow at the Brennan Center, as well as a professor at Brooklyn Law, Professor Amal Ahmed, uh, and Jesse Wegman, uh, the author of the, such a tremendous book, uh, for illuminating this uh, in all its dimensions, it, uh, all its consequences, intended and unintended. Um, and uh, it comes again at a moment when the nature of minority rule, in a sense, in the United States or the, the system of Madisonian checks, balances, and federalism uh, is becoming more and more evident uh, in more and more ways uh, to all of us, um, not merely in this presidential election season, but going forward as we look at the Congress, as we look at the Supreme Court. Thank you all for being part of this conversation. And the Brennan Center is delighted to have helped uh, host it. Sam. Michael, thank you for the Brennan Center's partnership tonight with the Federal Hall Conservancy, and special thanks to Ellen Toscano of New York University for initiating this collaboration. We're grateful, of course, to John Avalon and to our panel panelists for their insights into tonight's vital subject. Debate Defends Democracy is made possible by our generous funders, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, with additional gifts from the Stonebly Family Foundation and the Bogosian Quigley Family Foundation. While the Electoral College does play a major role in our elections, so do all of you. So please make your plans to vote in the weeks ahead, week ahead. To learn more about Federal Hall and our plans for a new day at Federal Hall, please visit federalhall.org. Good night.